Tower Colliery stands proud at the head of the Cannon Valley near the village of Hirwine in Mittler Morgan. The pit has been producing coal for over 150 years and at its prime employed 2,000 men. Throughout the past decade, Tower has moved from being a loss-making pit on a downward spiral to a modern coal mine which has made £28 million profit over the last three years. It now stands alone as the last deep mine in South Wales. In the last two years, British Coal have manipulated coal sales from 960,000 tons in 1992 down to 330,000 tons in 1994. The National Union of Mine Workers believed that this was done purely to slim down the workforce ready for the privatisation of the industry and with the ultimate aim of eventually leading to a local management buyout. With this ulterior motive in mind, British Coal used every dirty trick in the book to try and get the men out and close Tower Colliery. The local National Union of Mine Workers Lodge Committee and its loyal membership are known throughout the length and breadth of Great Britain for their active campaigning on many issues of importance to working people and their families. Not least the pit closures and privatisation programme. And they weren't about to sign away their pit and their future for a pot of fool's gold. This film tells the story of their fight. The fight to save Tower Colliery. But basically, Tower Colliery is a high profitable pit. It's made £26 million profit in the last three years. It's probably one of the most modern pits in Britain today because the old section underground, all the old workings, everything is new. Over the last few years, because of our high profits, and we produce anthracite coal, which is the most valuable product in as far as coal is concerned in Britain today, that uh, we're too big a pit really and too important not to be purchased and bought. So the intentions by British Coal Management was to buy Tower Colliery. To do that, they wanted to buy us outside the main package, which comes on the final day of privatization sometime in January of 95. Towards that end, Tower needed to be closed early so the local management could buy the pit. That was the colliery management's intention in early April of 1994. But the Tower miners were no April fools and responded in kind. The statement on behalf of the National Union Mine Workers to British Coal. The workforce at Tower Colliery, who are members of the National Union Mine Workers, demand the right to work. Tower Colliery is a profitable and viable colliery and has a major role to play in the economy for the Cannon Valley. We are incensed by the blackmailing tactics being used by British Coal, who are trying to pay off the workforce with enhanced payments of up to a further £9,000 extra on top of the present redundancy scheme. We want to exercise our right to go through the modified review procedure after taking a democratic vote by members of the National Union Mine Workers last Saturday, 9-4-94, in favour of that decision. We want full production to resume at the colliery, which is going to cease on Friday, the 15th of the 4th, 94, and to remain in full production up until that last day of nationalisation until the colliery goes into the private sector. We want our present market or an increase in our market to be guaranteed for Tower Colliery into Abathor Power Station for the remaining life of the pit. We want also the present redundancy scheme protected for our members and for all miners who have served this country with dignity and pride. And now that British Coal have offered enhanced payments of £9,000 to other unions at Tower Colliery to close the pit, we want it also to save the pit. But more importantly, we want employment and security for miners who have a role to play in the country today, saying the National Union Mine Workers workforce at Tower Colliery. Following the crucial vote taken on Saturday the 9th of April, over 60% of the men voted to fight to keep the pit open and forfeit the bribe of an extra £9,000 offered to them if they closed the pit immediately. On Monday the 11th of April, Union leaders were informed that management were telling the men to come up the pit and sign if they wanted the £9,000 and that they didn't have to stick to the decision which they had already made at a democratic meeting the previous Saturday. They even telephoned men at home and asked them to come to the pit and sign or give verbal intention and British Coal would sign for them. Right up until six o'clock that evening, British Coal were encouraging men to sign away their jobs, telling them they would lose money if they didn't. Still, they didn't get enough names to overthrow the vote taken on Saturday. Despite the rumour spreading and subtle pressure management were putting on them, the men stayed loyal to the Union Lodge and their leaders. However, not everybody wanted to stay at the pit and fight on. 
and opinions were divided. The fucking majority is now a colony. What's it a fucking war? And it's a majority yeah. 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 right. The next day, the pit manager met with the union and admitted he was wrong to try and unduly influence the men. He said he didn't know that Tower was officially in the modified colliery review procedure. Those people who had signed could not now have the redundancy, and he was sorry he had told them otherwise. The union's entire campaign strategy against Tower Colliery's closure was based around them being in the modified colliery review procedure. This was their protection and guarantee that present wages, terms and conditions of employment and redundancy payments would remain unchanged right up until privatisation of the pit. It also meant that they could fight on against the management's insistence on closing the pit some eight months before privatisation, safe in the knowledge that they wouldn't lose out financially. Tyrone O'Sullivan and many others believed that there was no logical reason for Tower Colliery to be closed right now. They believed that the decision to close the pit was politically motivated and due to the fact that Tower NUM had long been recognised as one of the most active branches in Great Britain. Because of the imminent privatisation of the coal industry, it was widely held that new working practices and terms and conditions of employment would be introduced in the months leading up to privatisation to make the industry more attractive to potential buyers. Inevitably, Tower NUM would be in the vanguard of the campaign to oppose any changes. And for that reason, it is believed that someone somewhere had made the decision that Tower Colliery must be closed by the 30th of April 1994. Later, the manager called the union leaders back to his office to inform them that COSA, the mining industry's white collar union, and NACODS, the pit deputies union, had accepted the £9,000 bribe offer and would be finishing on Friday and starting back at the pit the following week on new terms as contractors. This came as no surprise to the NUM, as Phil White explains. It all happened from last Wednesday, really, is when Eddie Heinmarsh, the director of the standalone colliery, announced that uh, due to the market forces prevailing against Tower Colliery, uh, he said that Tower Colliery is unable to survive in this climate. Uh, hence, that uh, is that we met then as a lodge committee on Thursday, uh, talked through what needed to be done, met with the manager again uh, on Friday as far as consultations are concerned, and then on Saturday, we held a committee meeting where we give a unanimous recommendation that even though miners were losing up to £9,000 by not accepting the board's uh, bribe offer, that we felt that we had a, a case that is unanswerable to go through the review. Following that general meeting, the recommendation was accepted by the majority of the annual NUM workforce at Tower Colliery, and then we made that news uh, uh, announcement to the manager that as far as the NUM at Tower concerned, we're going into the modified review procedure. But the sting in the tail of that is that the four other unions at the pit decided not to come along with the NUM to fight to save the pit, but they succumbed and gave in and told British Coal that they were prepared to accept the closure of Tower Colliery. And when we went into review, NACODS, three days earlier in this, informed British Coal that they wanted to take the pit for the review, they had a meeting then on the Sunday after our meeting. Their meeting then decided to pull out the review and ask for the colliery manager to give them the £9,000 enhanced payment. So instead of fighting alongside us, they've done along again what they've always done in the past, is betrayed us at the very last minute. Rumours were spreading around the pits like wildfire. What's these rumours that everybody's spreading the bombs there? Eh? What's that right now? Thank God they're off. Six people here. Huh? Tell the deputies they talk in a load of rubbish. That's what's going on upstairs. The rubbish good. Let's have a ten. Let's put the ten. Well, the point is, this is what the deputies wanted to do. Right? Them and Cosa can only get their hands on their money as long as we buckle on them. At half past two in the afternoon, the manager informed the NUM Lodge Committee that the nine thousand pounds bribe offer was back on the table, if they held a secret ballot of their members by Thursday. He also told them that he'd heard some news about the new redundancy scheme and it was a lot worse than the present one, with men standing to lose even more money. Half past two in the afternoon is the end of the main shift at Tower Colliery and the men are hurrying to get home. This means that the Union Lodge won't see most of them till the following morning. The management deliberately used this tactic of issuing news and information late 
so that other unions can spread it around the pit in the afternoon and night. British Coal's dirty tricks department was going into overdrive. Was it any wonder then that nobody at the pit seemed to know what the hell was going on? Any, any rumors you heard today taken as being correct? The phone was ringing constantly, with men wanting to know if this or that rumor was true or false, whether they ought to sign for redundancy and close the pit or carry on fighting. Tyrone had to check and double-check all the misinformation he was being fed, first with the union's area headquarters, and then with Arthur Scargill at the NUM national headquarters. Dave, what we, what we want is a facility of a general meeting. Yeah, now, um, the manager said the deadline was Midnight, is it? Mm. Yeah, well, I tell you what, we might have to go for a general meeting on Friday. Meanwhile, as media attention focused on Tower Colliery, messages of goodwill and support continued to pour in from various organisations and individuals. The churches believe that um, the position that the miners and the communities uh, have been placed under is wrong, that uh, more time should be taken over the decision, uh, that miners can talk to their families, friends, relatives uh, and the community around them uh, about the impact of the, the announcement from British Coal. And that's the fundamental purpose of my presence here, is to say that human beings need to be treated with dignity and respect. He went on to say just what he thought of British Coal's treatment of the miners. Fundamentally immoral. and. Uh, bordering on the evil, I would even say. All the unions at Tower were summoned to the manager's office at 10 a.m. to be told that if the pit was still in the modified colliery review procedure by Saturday, then British Coal would withdraw from it. They would then restart the pit with new production targets, meaning increased tonnage for lower rates of pay. The NUM Lodge had until midnight on Friday to explain this latest bombshell to their members and come to a decision. Having failed dismally with the £9,000 bribe offer, the colliery management had declared all out war on the NUM and redoubled their efforts to close down the pit. It's the worst news you've ever heard. The worst news that we could expect. Yeah. Think of the worst news you've ever think of and double it. And double it. Time before they not give us again. We can't hold meetings at pitted meetings, it's got to be a general meeting. And after to follow the law security yeah. meetings. Unless we find some way in the next uh, 12 hours to stop us from on. Stop us from on. And that's a difficult task. On the morning of Thursday the 14th of April, the Lodge Committee met with the manager and asked for a full list of NUM members and how their wages would be affected by the latest announcement. They also requested written confirmation on new coal targets. Without the correct information themselves, how were they to inform their members of what was going on and recommend appropriate action? By late morning, the news came through that the MP for the Cannon Valley, Anne Cluid, had taken direct action in support of the tower miners and had been smuggled down the mine by retired ex-miner Glyn Roberts to begin an underground protest. Anne Cluid, dressed in miners' clothing, was smuggled into the drift entrance to tower at Trigos Mountain this morning. She's now at the pit bottom, where she says she'll stay in protest at British Coal's attempts to close the mine. Fellow Labour MP Brian Sedgemore is in Wales supporting her campaign. He says she's determined. Well, as long as she's got the miners' support, she will not compromise. The courage of um, Anne Cluid is um, extraordinary, and she'll stay down there for as long as it takes. Tempers are high, and um, the cohort have to realise they have an extraordinary fight on their hands. British Coal has asked Ms. Cluid to leave, saying she's in the mine illegally. She says she'll stay until British Coal backs down and puts the pit through an independent review. The pit management were furious and threatened to discipline anyone caught talking to or helping the MP. What's happened? Well, to our great surprise, uh, Anne Cluid, our MP, uh, got into the pit and she's on the sit-down strike in Tower Colliery with uh, Mr. Glyn Roberts an ex-worker at Tower Colliery. Um, it came as a surprise, but it's a tremendous uh, achievement by her to think that uh, the MP of the Cannon Valley uh, are so dedicated to save Tower Colliery in the conditions 
the black men that we don't know. Well, that's the old man again. You know, they're sitting in to change the opinion of British Paul and the government to give us more time to look at our future. The media were banned from the colliery and more pressure was piled on the NUM membership, with the Lodge Committee being given a list of their members facing wage cuts of up to £90 a week. The NUM National Office, meanwhile, confirmed that Tower Colliery was still in the modified colliery review procedure, and no individual person or organisation could take them out of it. Wages could not be cut, and present redundancy terms were protected. A union general meeting was held to discuss the latest proposals and management threats. Forty minutes into that meeting, a letter arrived from the pit manager. It said, Dear Mr O'Sullivan, re-tower colliery. I understand that you may be asking your members to take part in a further vote on the future of tower colliery at 10 a.m. today. I think it would be helpful if before the vote takes place, I make clear to you and your members British Coal's position. If your members vote to oppose British Coal's proposal to close Tower Colliery, British Coal will formally withdraw that proposal and operations at Tower Colliery will continue. You will understand that in these circumstances, no further consultation in connection with closure will take place because there will be no proposal on which to consult. You and your members are fully aware of the redundancy benefits available in the event that your members vote to accept early closure. Yours sincerely, DJ Fox, colliery manager. This was yet another dirty trick to try and get the miners to close their pits. Although confused and disillusioned, the men remained defiant, backing their union and endorsing the decision to fight on and oppose closure. Their leaders, meanwhile, were left to explain their actions to the media. It was very positive. Um, we, we were we just confirmed uh, this morning that only Tower Colliery can follow the river procedure, and British Coal have not got the right to pull us out. Uh, towards that end, we are confident, we made our decision, we're staying in, and we're fighting back. We are not accepting that ridiculous thing from last week of British Coal. Now, we've got to go to work, but there's more coal for less money. That's no offer to Tower Colliery. So we're in the review, we're staying in, and we're going to prove once and for all that Tower Colliery is a bit for the future. But is it going to cost you money? Are you working for a reduced wage? We've We've already given away £9,000. The wages we are next week, unless we get the pit back into production, yes, it costs us money. We won't give a bonus. So our next aim is to get the pit back into production to prove that the pit can make money and go forward into privatisation. And the mood of the men here was unanimous, that you're all determined to fight on I would not say unanimous. I'm not that silly. But it was overwhelming. What do you want to say about British Force handling of the situation? Well, it is terrible from the very beginning. It, it goes back, as somebody said yesterday, back to the 1830s. Exactly. That's the tactics they use. They terrify the travel probably will show them up for what they are. Closing the pit, that's probably one of the best prospects in the country today. So, so why did British Coal tell you then you, that you would have to work for reduced wages? Because they wanted us to accept the redundancy and close the pit ourselves. So that no blame would be put on British Coal. All these tactics are not to give the tower a future for the men. It's to close the pit for us to sell our jobs and for us to blame ourselves. So British Coal pretend that they're then innocent. It's not working and it's hurting them. There's a long way to go yet. I say again today, British Coal I'm finished with the workmen of Tower Colliery. They're the worst employers in the country. We don't treat at all. Did you all unanimously decide to fight on now? No, there's no vote taken. That's all it was. It's an uh, up-to-date uh, position in regards to it. The men didn't want to vote. We'd already made a decision last, uh, last Saturday, so there's no problem. As far as we're concerned, uh, the position is still the same now. And the fight goes on. The fight goes on. The Union Lodge Committee returned to the pit to inform the manager of the men's decision. Because Anne Clewitt had been denied food and water for the duration of her protest, the Union asked her to come up the pit with Glyn Roberts. They emerged triumphantly to a great welcome from the miners of Tower. The underground protest had succeeded in its aim of throwing a spotlight on the dispute and gaining it maximum local and national publicity. It seemed that the NUM had got what they wanted and the British Coal Press release confirmed this. It stated that the NUM could continue to oppose the closure through the modified colliery review procedure. The corporation had decided to withdraw its closure proposal 
and normal operations were to be resumed immediately. Tower Colliery would continue coal mining and development operations for the remainder of the year and be offered for sale as a fully working pit. The men were to be paid fully in accordance with the industry's collective agreements. No redundancies, no closure. The miners had won their fight to keep the pit open. However, they were soon to discover that victory came with a heavy price attached to it. It may seem as a victory to some that we said, yes, British Coal have for the very first time pulled a colliery out of review procedure. We are saying the vindictiveness behind that victory is that they've increased our tonnage to produce from 330,000 tonnes to 530,000 tonnes. But not only that, they are now asking colliers at the face and miners throughout the length of the colliery to produce coal for virtually half wages than what we were on prior to us going into the review. So British Coal have come back with the ultimate punishment. He said, OK, you buggers, you wanted this fight. You were the ones that want your jobs, have them. But you have them at the price. And not only at the price of producing more coal for less wages, is that the redundancy where we asked for it to be protected up until the last day of nationalisation, until the colliery is handed over to the private sector, has now been reduced by £17,000. Now that Anne Clewitt was safely out of the pit and the media spotlight dimmed, the management decided it was time to deliver their hammer blow. What the press release was telling the public at large was a big difference to what the manager was telling the NUM. He confirmed that the earlier wage cuts documents he had given them were the terms he was going to implement at the pit. So although British Coal was officially telling the public that the miners had won and got all they wanted, unofficially, the stark reality was that they intended to make them pay and pay hard for daring to oppose their closure plans. The hidden agenda of the early closure of Tower Colliery, leading up to a local management buyout, was becoming ever more obvious as they became ever more devious. The truth of the matter was that by the proposed closure date of 30th of April, each man would lose £10,000 in redundancy pay. They would also have to work up until December 1994 on wages 33% lower than at present, with this cutback in wages further affecting any eventual redundancy deal. This meant that the men at Tower Colliery were being asked to work for the eight months leading up to the privatisation of the pit at a financial loss to them of £17,000, and with no guarantee as to the future of their present terms and conditions of employment once the pit was in the private sector. A hollow victory indeed. It seemed that they were caught in a classic catch-22 situation. They were damned if they did, and damned if they didn't. British coal had set them up for revenge. Well, it's deplorable. I mean, they, they are playing with men's li uh, minds, they are playing with men's lives. It's that we can ill afford to put our members through mental torture. And, 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 and that, unfortunately, is the situation. I mean, they're not all the same as us. I mean, we've been in the game of representing men negotiate with British Gold, cons consulting with British Gold for a long, long time. And when our members don't have that sort of first-hand action, they don't see uh, the, the picture as clear as we do then. But, I mean, this is the ultimate price that we've got to pay for taking the state mechanism on. And it's not British Coal, it's above them altogether. All it's British Coal being pulled with strings by the Tory government. It's Edgar and Heseltine and the rest of the crew telling them the men at Tower Colliery are getting an embarrassment. They are getting support through the length and breadth of this country, which is to us is so dangerous that a small spark could set off a fire. If that spark sets off that fire, then you will have to come back. Because this government can't take, or ill afford then, I would say, to see other angles of action being taken by other workers in support of Tower Colliery. They need to isolate us and they need to take us out, and they held bent on taking us out. A meeting was hurriedly arranged between the full lodge committee, George Rees, General Secretary of the South Wales NUM, and Arthur Scargill, President of the NUM. This meeting could not come up with any guarantees of staying in the modified colliery review procedure under the protection it afforded them, only challenges to it in the courts, and there was no time available for this. 
How are you? Oh, good. Kick on now. In by your hands. Keep it more on, my The Lords decided to call another meeting to explain to the men that they did not have the full protection of the modified colliery review procedure and that at some time in the near future they might be pulled out. In the meantime, they decided as a lodge to vote to fight on. In my personal opinion, even if I would have had to have lost all my riddance, I wanted to keep fighting, because I think that we could have damaged, in the next six to seven months, damaged this government to such an extent that we could have made them resign early, or at least put them at such a low position that they would never have ever had won an election in this country again. Support for the men of Tower was growing all over the country, and hundreds of letters and telephone calls came in each day, urging them to fight on. The miners themselves, however, needed all the facts about what was happening so far, and what further dirty tricks the management were getting up to. The Union Lodge also needed more time to gather the necessary information to put to their members. We were waiting for the management to come back to us, uh, with it in black and white, of the public announcement made yesterday by the DTI or by Clark of British Coal. Also, that British Coal said that the men must produce coal at the very basic rate of pay. Now then, we want him to break down every man that's on a wage which he's entitled to today, to see what wage he'll be entitled to as and from next Monday. And the breakdown in that is, is quite significant, because at our colliery, we've negotiated wages for our members over and above what they should be entitled to. Because we've always seen to add fair play here. If a man is working hard, we would form a manager, then our man should be given some more money. Even though we kept always within the confines of the national bargaining policy, we've never gone lower than the rate that's applicable, and we've always seemed to enhance it, but not outside the agreement. So it's important, uh, as far as we're concerned, is that come Monday, that if men were guaranteed, what I said earlier, that the present redundancy package is guaranteed to them, on a rate, not expecting wages as high as we've had them, but not to take a drop of £150, we can continue working it. But if British Coal are not going to be prepared to do that, it's going to be a hell of a job on our hands tomorrow to convince men of an insecure future after seven months that it's going to leave, lose £17,000 today. And of course, for that seven months that they'll be in, is that their wages are going to be half. The additional information was not forthcoming, and they were kept waiting. They asked for a 24-hour extension, but British Coal refused it. The deadline for the decision as to whether to accept what was on offer or reject it was 6.30 that evening. They needed to know exactly what it was they would be asking the men to vote on, because at present the picture wasn't at all clear. The pressure was mounting by the minute. Tyrone O'Sullivan then asked Anne Cluett to speak to British Coal's director, Neil Clark, personally, to ask him to grant the union a 24-hour extension. Clark refused. The miners' whole future at Tower Colliery rested on that one decision. At the 11th hour of such an important time in their lives, they were refused an extra day to prepare their case. At 12.30, the miners' leaders attended a pre-arranged general meeting and once more had to tell the men of British Coal's duplicity, stubbornness, double-crossing and ultimate betrayal. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. The men could take no more of the relentless pressure being brought to bear on them by a scheming, malevolent management. Faced with the daunting prospect of working on under such a management, plus an uncertain future under private ownership possibly made up of that same management, and the impending loss of thousands of pounds in redundancy entitlements, the men and their families could take no more. They had fought valiantly, but the odds had always been stacked against them. At the end of the day, the price of opposing closure was too high, both in human and financial terms. Faced with all this unrelenting pressure, the men reluctantly voted to take their redundancy and go. As a final act of defiance, they voted unanimously that the Lodge would steadfastly refuse to sign any document stating that they, in any way, had agreed with the closure of Tower Colliery. Well, British Coal hasn't closed the pit since 1984-85, have they? They've always interpreted this, that, that the men have voted to either discontinue the fight or accept the closure. It's not that, is it? 
its British call announced the closure. The men resisted the closure. British call announced the closure was still on. What we said, and we continued, and we did it at the very end, we will not put our names to a piece of paper that British call requested accepting the closure. We rejected that fully, we refused to sign it. Because I haven't accepted the closure, I'm still fighting against the closure. British call have closed us, no matter what John Major says or anybody else. And I hope that the courage we've had for the resilience and the resistance the men have shown, it'll be proven that miners didn't close calories. British call did by announcing them in the first place. British call closed Tower Colliery on Friday the 22nd of April 1994. Tyrone, Phil and many others vowed that they would return to their pit. No one at that time, however, could have foreseen when or how. Well, I think Tower Colliery, there's two options. The one is that Open Castle buy us and close the pit and just take our market. The other option is that the pit is such a high, highly profitable pit and I've seen documents by British Coal that says that it will make 71 million pound profit in the next four years that the pit will be bought. Or we will try to make sure. I think there's plenty of buyers around. I think loads of people can see the potential in Teller and markets out there which we can go and find besides the one in Aberthaw. So I think that the pit, the pit will be bought and uh, what I hope is that the miners will be a part of that buyout and have a say in the wages, terms and conditions of the people employed here. The miners became more than just a part in the buyout, they were the buyout. And almost immediately another fight began. The fight to buy Tower Colliery. A full-scale campaign was quickly organised, building on the support and goodwill which was already there. Only this time for a new goal. We decided immediately after the pit closed that we would continue with our bid for the pit. Uh, because we did it immediately, uh, it shook up the management intended buyout. Because we put our bid in first and then we were granted the only money from the DTI. So, first of all, we were first in and then we were granted 80,000 of the DTI to support our bid. That then stopped the management bid in without the money from the DTI. It was also made very embarrassing for them. How could they build bid for the pit immediately after the closure when they had been quoted as saying the pit uh, wasn't viable? So this has caused us many problems with local British coal management because they have been uh, very unhelpful with some of the information they could have given us in early months. Since then, we've gone ahead and we've uh, picked, uh, first of all, we went to um, Pr uh, Price Waterhouse. Uh, it's ironical when you think of it that Price Waterhouse was the company that secret stated us in 1984-85, uh, uh, but we felt from the beginning if we we're going to go for a bid, we want the best bid. They even offered the hand of friendship and cooperation to their old enemy, who for so long had obstructed their efforts to keep the pit open. We initially had fairly interim talks with the manager of saying that the best thing possible for the pit to survive after the privatisation was for management employee buyout. But uh, woe and behold, the management pull out and left it by ourselves. So what we've done since April is that we've now gone for a full employee, 100% employee bid for the pit. So really all the activities, even with the large business that we carry out, most activities have been is mounting a campaign and a bid to get the pit back which we hope within a couple of weeks' time that we know whether or not we are the preferred bidder or the final bidder for the pit. MPs were lobbied and letters and petitions were fired off to John Redwood, Secretary of State for Wales, and Michael Heseltine at the Department of Trade and Industry. Support for the miners' buyout bid was huge and everyone in the Cannon Valley and many thousands more in the rest of Wales and Great Britain rallied to their cause. Supported very much, yes. I think they should buy it back, bring the jobs back, back to where they've lost them now. That's a good thing. Bring jobs to the valley, yeah. Well, they deserve to get it anyway, don't they? And I hope they can make a bomb out of it. Yeah, I would support, yeah. But certainly support them and I wish them the best of luck.
I think you'll find that most of the people around here will support them. The local council provided them with office space in Aberdeen, and Tebow, Tower Employees Buyout, and its founders, all NUM Lodge Committee men, co-opted individuals and loyal members of the union, worked tirelessly throughout the rest of the year to present what they knew in their hearts to be the best bid. The men have had every confidence in us as a lodge, and we've had every confidence in the men as a lodge. And uh, I think overall that that mutual feeling and respect for each other made sure that we were going to go the right road. They've got no doubt when, when we asked the men, let's make a bid, they were 100% behind it. When we asked the men initially to cough up £2,000, 100% behind it. When we asked the men for a further 6000 on top of two, 100% behind it. Every way through, every step taken, there's every confidence that we're going to get forward. And the confidence, I said, is mutual respect from both parties. Their unstinting effort and that of their wives, families, friends and supporters everywhere was finally rewarded with the news that they'd been waiting to hear. In October, they were announced as the preferred bidder for the pit. We had by far the best business planning. Not only that, we had the situation where we were employing the most. And not only employing the most, paying decent wages and still making a profit. Uh, I think we, we blew the rest out of the water. I think it was a strong political influence. I think at the end of the day, uh, the Tory party could always use it to their advantage by saying that they had given the pit to the workers. It's a part of their new policy. Uh, so that was an advantage to them. Uh, we played that up as well. Uh, after all, if you're there, you play to win. But I think the most important thing of all was our business plan. Uh, and now to build yourself call. Cool. I think it's going to be very successful. I think it's wonderful. I wish them every success. Well, I think it's good. I think it's very good for the kind of valley. I think the miners in our economy have done a marvellous thing. And it was one of the best. And it just showed this government what could be done in South Wales. Well, I think that they fought a very long and what seemed at some times an impossible battle. And I think that it's uh, an incentive for anybody who thinks that they're beaten to go about trying to uh, do something because uh, I think that if anybody had taken odds on it when they started, they wouldn't have thought that they could have managed it. But manage it they did. And on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, Santa Claus well and truly arrived with the keys to the pit. Everywhere, wherever you go, uh, people are stopping you and shaking your hand and saying, it's the first victory at working people have had for a long, long time. And they do see it as a victory for the working class. They see that these men marching back to the tower is a victory, a victory for the whole movement, a victory for ordinary people. Uh, at the time, for 15 years, we haven't seen any victories. Oh, it, it's well recognised as, as a positive step for working people in Britain. Commenting on British Coal's efforts earlier on in the year when they tried their damnedest to get the miners out and close the pit, Tyrone had this to say. It's a typical British Coal tactics. Uh, and not only that, I think it's even higher up than local management. Uh, they picked out about 20 pits that they thought would be ideal for privatisation. Tower was one of them. That's why we were the last pit in, in, in South Wales and the last pit in Britain to be closed. Um, they used the tactics of the last two years to close the colliery in such a way that they could buy it back perfectly. And they were putting things in place for their company to take advantage of once they bought the pit. A fantastic team. Norman Watson, the lead advisor from the Water Consultancy Agency, the first man we went to when we wanted to buy the pit. The rest of the team, you know, Bill Roberts, Bill White, Ken Davis, Guy John Jones. On the 22nd of April, he closed the pit. We only had nine days to qualify to buy the pit. And through the help of Norman Watson, he guided us through the nine days. Everything else is history. The ultimate privatization. The workers running their own industry. Tower Colliery now belong to them. The future their future was now in their own hands. We've got to remember one thing, that Tawa has been different, and always has been different. 
We never ever work without the workforce supporting what we're doing. We remain loyal to them and try to be honest with them over many, many years. Now, when you achieve that, uh, that loyalty doesn't come easy. It comes to the proof you put in the years before. And because of that, the men trusted us. And because of that trust, we were able to show strong leadership. Now, you can't go forward with, with just the colonel or the lieutenants marching. The whole army's got to march. Uh, that was built up over a long, long period. And the only way you can get working people to trust you is to be honest with them through difficult times as well as the good times. And at the end of the day, it was a fantastic army. There may have been good generals, but there were bloody good soldiers too. That hard fight by the tower miners to save their pit meant that they could look forward to a happy new year in 1995, when Tyrone and those bloody good soldiers, families, friends and supporters marched victorious into Tower Colliery on Monday, the 2nd of January. The fight to save Tower Colliery was now over and to the victors went the spoils. What we did was, the Tories set the rules and we matched them. We got a good, a, a good business plan, we got a good financial company, we had a good set of lawyers, we had a good management team, but most of all, we went out there to the people and we made it impossible for the Tories not to give us the pick. And remember that, if there's anything that might be want, you've got to go out, and you've got to work for it, you must fear nobody, and only wish for victory. And if you want it enough, you get it. Thank you all, have a good new year, then damn it to right well, and everybody else in Tower Colliery. Thank you. <laughs> all of us are coming, thank you very much, we're going to cut the cake. <laughs> Now that the celebrations are over, the hard work begins as the struggle to survive and make a success of their venture goes on. <laughs>